A very good evening, dear students. Welcome all to the fifth module of the PG training program conducted by Code of Thermal Society. Today we have yet another an important topic to be addressed: B scan and retinal lasers. And to teach you all this about this very interesting topic and important topic, we have Dr. Biju John, additional professor from RIO Trivandrum. I'm sure at least some of you will be get, get inclined to withdraw at their services after listening to his class. Dr. Biju is an excellent teacher, writer, uh, script writer, poet, etc., etc., etc. Warm welcome, Dr. Biju. Thank you. Dear students, try to make the best out of this PG session through discussion and clearing your doubts. Dr. Viju is ready to help you out with B scan and retinal laser. Now, let me also welcome Dr. Patma. Welcome, Patma. She is additional professor, Medical College, Kodi Kodi. Thank you, madam. Another, another ardent teacher to moderate this session. Now, over to Mihir. And thank you all once again, and good luck. Good evening, all. Uh, welcome to the fifth module of our PG exam buster series. Uh, we have with us today uh, Dr. Biju John from RIO Trivandrum. Dr. Biju did his post graduation from Medical College Trivandrum. He has also done his BNB and FOCS. He has done his fellowship in vitreoretinal surgery, uh, minimally invasive vitrectomy surgery, and advanced phaco surgery. He has received the best uh, video presentation award at ASOS Drishti 2015. He also received the best video award at the annual CME of Kollam of Club in 2019. He has been a regularly invited faculty at state and national conferences, and he keeps conducting instruction courses every year. Currently, he is the additional professor at RIO Trivandrum. So today's session will be moderated by Dr. Padma, who is an additional professor at MCH Calicut. So I hand over the session uh, to Dr. Padma. Uh, Dr. Padma. Good evening, all. Um, good evening, uh, Biju sir. Welcome to Calicut. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, B scan is an important investigation, especially when the media is hazy. When you want to know what is inside the structural details to measure the uh, lesion and even in prognostication. Uh, similarly, lasers uh, has have been a mainstay in the treatment of retinal disease, though uh, nowadays is being replaced by intravitreal injections and surgery. Laser has still a significant role to play in retinal diseases. So uh, I would welcome Biju sir to give your uh, wonderful lecture and let us all listen to him and clear our doubts. Over to Biju sir. First of all, thank you for the nice welcome and, and the warm words. Thanks especially to the upfront Dr. Viji, Dr. Sujit, Dr. Mihir, Dr. Batma. Thank you Chaos for having me here. So this is our topic for today. and. Uh, even though we have got two topics, I think I will concentrate more on the ultrasound base interpretation because everything uh, uh, together, including the laser also, it is a bit crowded. So I think the laser I would be keeping a, uh, a little more brief, brief account, brief overview of the laser. So we will just go into detail about the ultrasound because of two reasons. One thing. Mainly the postgraduates, you know, you, you encounter the ultrasound as the charts. You have got these charts examinations. You will be handed over charts in your examination and you will have to probably describe what it is and maybe a few questions would be asked. But other than that, when you are doing the ultrasound, what I are generally seen is that just do it. I mean, Generally, people don't do it in a systematic way. Just keep your B scan, just have an axial scan and get something. And uh, you just uh, sort of read from the printouts like that. So just for the examination point of view, you just need to read a printout. Generally, you will be 
shown only very specific and very important B scans like the detachment, some PVD, then um, uh, choroidal tumor, and melanoma, things like that. But just for completion's sake, I will just go in a systematic way, thinking that it should probably help you to at least streamline the way you are examining patients with the B scan because this is a very wonderful instrument, especially when you have got a uh, an eye with a media with a cloudy media which doesn't allow you to actually see the fundus and but diagnosing what is inside would be important for your management and even if things like OCT has come I don't think there is going to be a replacement for the B scan so this is the instrument and uh, ultrasound means something which is uh, not audible to human ear which is more than 20 kilohertz the ophthalmic ultrasound the frequency is 8 to 10 megahertz and the UBM we use the frequency of 50 to 100 megahertz so the most important part of the ultrasound is the transducer itself the transducer has got a piezoelectric crystal inside here there's a mark here and this piezoelectric crystals when it vibrates it converts the electrical energy which comes here into sound energy specifically ultrasound energy and this vibrates and sends a pulse of ultrasound perpendicular to the probe which goes into the eye or whatever surface is being scanned and this sound get reflected back and is received by the same piezoelectric crystal like this it gets reflected back and is received by the same piezoelectric crystal the crystal again vibrates and again the sound is now converted back into electrical energy and this electrical energy it just goes as an impulse into the motherboard where it will be amplified it passes through the amplifier it gets amplified and it also gets rectified which means that it is converted into a sine wave it is a biphasic wave then it gets converted into a sine wave and finally it reaches the uh, display monitor and you get that image now this is an A scan probe so an A scan just sends one pulse wave and get back one reflection so the main areas where it is reflected is you can see the cornea the two surfaces of the lens and the RCS complex. So you get this mainly the three spikes. But in a B scan, what happens is that it is just like moving the S scan probe from one area to another area, scanning multiple areas. So which means that a lot of S scans are there. And just imagine turning this all the S scans 90 degrees and what you get will be dots in front of the screen and each of these S can which produces three dots because of three spikes and results in uh, intensity modulation of the sensor in the screen resulting in the picture which is composed of all these dots and that is the B scan so that is just the principle now you always usually have a simultaneous a diagnostic S can also go in along with the B scan. The objective of this is that you know it is B scan which is composed of multiple dots actually it doesn't allow you to compare the intensity of one dot to the other in a systematic way or in a precise manner. So in situations where you need to know or compare the amplitudes then you have to look at the corresponding A scan. It also allows you to know that the B scan waves are or the are going perpendicular to the tissue being scanned. Only if the scanning is perpendicular to the tissue which is being scanned, then only you will be getting a bright ultrasound image. So that also you need to actually refer back to the SI, I mean, corresponding S scan. And this is another important thing that everybody has to remember, which I think everybody knows. There is a marker at the tip of the transducer, and the marker 
will correspond to the top of the B scan. So this area will be the picture, the area which is scanned will appear in the top of this picture. So that is also important because you need to know the orientation. When you have a picture like this, you need to know which is superior, which is inferior, which is temporal, which is nasal like that. Now, trauma positions is important. There are three types of positions. One is transverse, longitudinal and axial. The transverse is the main screening examination position. So in the transverse, you have the eye looking in the direction of the observer's interest and the probe is kept parallel to the limbus, placed on the opposite conjunctival surface, which means that if you want to scan the six o'clock, the probe will be placed parallel to the opposite limbus at 12 o'clock. And uh, if you want the temporal area to be scanned, it will be kept here. And the direction is such that the marking will be in the towards the nasal in the horizontal direction and vertical in the vertical direction so either superiorly or nasally that is orientation of the mark so and the longitudinal eye is again looking at the direction of the observer the probe is perpendicular to the limbus placed on the opposite conjunctival surface and the probe marker is directed towards the limbus or towards the area of interest and the axial scan, i.e. is the primary gaze and the probe is centered on the cornea. Now when you start the screening, you start with the transverse scan. The transverse scans are the main screening scans because it helps you to actually bypass the lens. The lens will not be in the picture. So which will improve the quality of the images that you are going to get. Because going through the lens is going to actually decrease the uh, resolution because it decreases the amount of reflection, amount of it decreases the, uh, the sound waves uh, penetration and the reflection back. So this is the transfer scan of the inferior quadrant. The eye here is looking inferiorly, probe is parallel to the limbus, placed superiorly, marker is nasal, inferior six clock hours is scanned and the scan will be centered at the six o'clock. And so this scan is referred to as a T6 scan. T6, which means that the inferior six clock hours centered around the six o'clock is being scanned. And this is a transverse scan of superior orbit where the upper six clock hours is being scanned and is centered at the 12 o'clock. And that is why this scan will be designated as T12. The other one was T6, this is T12. So similarly, this will be T9 because this is a right eye and you are scanning temporal six o'clock away the probe is nasally uh, the marker is superior and uh, the scanned area will be centered around the nine o'clock so this is t9 and this would be t3 this is the scanning the nasal uh, six o'clock hours of the right eye and will be centered at the three o'clock and so this is t3 so the three, four transfer scans, T6, T12, T3, and T9. And this is an axial scan. You can see that it is, the probe is perpendicular to the uh, cornea and the marker is towards the 12 o'clock. That is why this is called AX12 or axial 12. Now, a better screening axial position would be this one. That is AX3 in the right eye or the uh, this is otherwise called a horizontal axial scan where the marker is horizontal. Here it is toward the nasal aspect. The advantage of this is that you can get the optic nerve head as well as the macula in a single horizontal scan. So this will be the area of the optic nerve and the temporal will be the macula. So in this scan, the upper portion you will be able to see the optic nerve head shadow and in the lower portion you will be able to see the macula so since this axial scan helps you to get both the macula and the optic nerve in a single scan it is supposed to be the best axial scan for screening so these five scans that is the t12 t3 t6 t9 plus the axial 
horizontal axis that is either 3 or 9 depending upon which eye you are scanning constitutes the five screening position five basic screening positions for the ultrasound now so uh, this is when you don't know what you are scanning you are just basically going blindly you have got a flop where you don't see what is in you don't know what is inside the media is very hazy okay and even in the screening also you need to do it in two ways the initial one would be with a high gain that is what you see here with a high gain and then you reduce the gain so as to increase the resolution you can see that the resolution is better for example you can see that the axial complex can be better differentiated into the different layers here here it is not possible here it is picking up a lot of the vitreous echoes here it is not so high gain scan and low gain scan in all basic scan. now suppose you get something in the basic screening positions then you will have to go into that area a little more in detail so you make sure that your transfer scan is done in such a manner that it is perpendicular to the lesion that you detected and also do a longitudinal scan in the same area by turning the probe such a way so here, here you can see this is a longitudinal scan of the 12 o'clock it is opposite to the placed at 6 o'clock limbus, the marker is towards the cornea and this is scanning the uh, longitudinal area that is one clock hour only it will be scanning so this will be called as an L12 that is it is just scanning one clock hour but the one clock hour which it is scanning it will be scanning from anterior to posterior so that is how you go so basically you go for the screening and if you get something in the screening then you go for the additional positions now this is a horizontal axial scan just to explain the characteristic of a normal ultrasound here you can see that being an axial scan you will be seeing the lens here if it is a transverse scan you will not be seeing the lens transverse alone you will not be seeing the lens because it bypasses the lens so here you can see that the lens is an oval highly reflective structure with intra lesional echoes also this intra lenticular echoes will be higher when the lens opacity increase or the lens when, when, it, when it becomes cataractive because it produces interfaces now the vitreous is echo lucid so sometimes there will be low reflective echoes because as you know when the uh, when the, along with the aging there will be vitreous vitreous synergies and thereby you will be getting small echoes there and uh, the optic now there is a wedge shaped acoustic void in the retinal bar region in the axial scan here and the orbit is highly reflective that is because of the orbital fat it is not because the orbital fat per, fat per se is highly reflective it is just because the orbital fat will be comprised of multiple layers and these multiple layers produces interface and this interfaces is actually which is responsible for this high reflectivity of the uh, or due to the orbital fat and the extraocular muscle is generally echo lucent uh, and will be seen as low reflective fusiform structures. Now, you will always, whenever you see a lesion in one eye, you will always compare with the other eye because some of these characteristics that you pick up in the one eye, for example, a vitreous echoes, if you just look at the other eye, you will see that that is there in the other eye also. So, you can conclude that it is another. So, examining the other eye is also important. Now, all these scans you will have to explain with three parameters so that is again another tip which we would like to give the postgraduate you know, that you have handed a B scan chart in your examination see even if you don't know what the lesion is just start explaining in terms of this lesion you can just say that just just go by these three parameters first thing is the topography that is the, the shape of the lesion and the extent so you will have three types of lesion mainly one is point echoes that is point shaped echoes second is membrane like echoes and third is a mass like echoes so whatever is the case you will be able to decipher one of these you can say there is a point like echoes here or a mass like or a uh, membrane like this case. so that much at least anybody would be able to pick up from the chart then second thing is that if you are comfortable you can go into the quantitative which means the reflectivity you are looking at the reflectivity of the internal structure this is basically uh, more important in the case of tumors 
And for example, here you can see that, uh, and for the knowing the reflectivity, you should compare it with the S-scan also. So here you can see this is a, uh, actually showing the B-scan, the, the spikes from uh, the corresponding B, A scan of a B scan showing an oral melanoma. You can see there is a high intensity spike here. Then there is low internal reflective. That is why this A scan, you can see that the height is decreased. Then the height again increases when it reaches the orbit. So by observing the spike height, so you look at the, you comment about the internal reflectivity. And the third important thing is mobility. For example, this is important when we have a membrane shadow so you need to actually look at the mobility by because basically ultrasound this is a dynamic scan ideally you are not supposed to diagnose anything by looking just at the printout you need to have a video but in your examination anyway you are not going to get a video you will be handed printout so even if we uh, you know constantly tell you that you do not diagnose on printout you should always look at the video the corresponding air scan but in examination practically i mean everybody knows that you will be given printouts so you should know that also so three things the shape then the reflectivity then the mobility okay now so this tells you about the shape so you can see that there are three types of uh, two types of echoes here so these are the point echoes that we are seeing so we'll describe it as point uh, hyperechoic point shape hyperechoic lesion. So this could be a vitreous hemorrhage. This could be a vitreous hemorrhage. Can even be a vitreitis. Can even be endophthalmitis. I mean, just because uh, point echoes are there, you will not be able to differentiate that from vitreous hemorrhage endophthalmitis like that. Just based on the point echoes. Now here you can see a membrane echo. Now this membrane, you can see that it is a highly reflective membrane. Uh, it is an undulating membrane and you can see that it is attached to the optic nerve. So you obviously know that you are dealing with the retinal detachment here. And this is the optic nerve shadow. And uh, okay. And here you see that the third type, the mass-like echoes. So this is a typical collar button shaped deletion. So this is a mass-like echo. Here also you can be describing it as you will be uh, this is a uh, mass-like echo with a collar button shape. And uh, there is an associated elevation here, which is suggestive of a detachment like that you can describe. Okay, now just uh, going into some specific conditions. One is in the vitreous. Now, this is something which I think everybody will be able to pick up. Now, it would be always uh, uh, good, I mean, impressive in the examination and practically useful in your usual diagnosis if you just look at what is happening here also. Now, because you need to know what scan this is in order to correctly ascertain the morphology where the lesion etc is. For example, here you can see that you see there are multiple point lag echoes here. Okay, so this could be vitreous hemorrhage or this could be just the normal vitreous because those echoes are not very highly bright. This is actually taken at a gain of 110 decibel. You can see the 110 decibel. 110 decibel is a relatively high gain. And so even a normal vitreous analysis will, can actually uh, come up with a B scan like this. So this is not a vitreous analysis. It's just like it is a normal vitreous analysis. This is because it is taken at a high gain. And here you can see a membrane-like shadow, but this is a very thin shadow. Here it is not very highly reflective. And can you comment on the optic nerve attachment of this a particular membrane Even that you don't see an optical attachment but you remember that this is a transverse scan see trans 12 which means that this is a transverse b scan of the 12 o'clock which means that the probe is in the six o'clock position only the upper six clock hours is scanned and in those six clock hours you are not going to get the optic nerve shadow so this from this picture you will not be able to comment on the optic nerve head attachment. So we need other scans like that. So that is why you need to look at what is written here also. And this shows which eye, this is the right eye. Okay. Now, this one, this is a very, you know, these are the types of pictures that you will be handed over in the examination because these are, you know, even without knowing which scan, what area, transfer the longitudinal, you know, this can only be one thing. So highly bright point like echoes and correspondingly you see the air scan you can see that these are all high so each of the spot is giving 
high spikes. See, almost large high spikes, almost on the same uh, height as of the osteous complex. And you can see a dark area, no, a dark area which clearly separated from the RCS complex retina. So this is very typical of asteroid hyalosis because the calcium of the giving highly reflective signals and the posterior cortex is clear. This is not a PVD, just the posterior cortex is clear. So this sort of an appearance is only seen in asteroid hyalosis. Sometimes the silicon oils, emulsified silicon oil can also give rise to high, uh, highly bright spots like this. Okay, and this one, this is a vitreous hemorrhage. You can see that uh, there are coin like echoes here, and this coin like echo is bounded by a membrane. So there's a definite membrane here, and there is a, a collusion space between the retina and the membrane, or the RCS complex and this membrane. And there is no optic nerve head attachment. So this is probably a posterior vitreous detachment, and the hemorrhage is inside the vitreous, or is an intragel hemorrhage. Now, and this one here also you will be seeing multiple uh, point echoes, but along with the point echoes, you can see that a few membranes also here, clumps like this. You see multiple membranes here, and there is no PVD, there is multiple membranes here. Membranes here. So, this is actually a B scan of an endophthalmitis. Just because when you see these point like echoes, Based on that alone, you won't be differentiated an endophthalmitis from a vitreous hemorrhage. But when you see more of these membrane-like echoes, especially when there is when the when there is uh, membrane-like echoes, and if there are associated features, you should always look for associated features like an X-ray or tractional detachment, oral detachment, retinopolar thickening. That is why you can maybe conclude that this endophthalmitis just based on the Point echoes alone, you will not be able to conclude it is endophthalmitis. You look at the clinical features also. Because obviously, the patient will be coming with clinical features suggestive of endophthalmitis. And when you have a doubt whether this is endophthalmitis, that is when you do a scan. And uh, when you get a picture like this, then probably you can conclude that it is an endophthalmitis. Now, looking at the retina. So, this membrane like uh, shadows, you need to be. Uh, study in detail because this is one of the commonest B scan which is kept in the examination. So you can have three types of membranes, and you will be a, should be able to, and you should, you will be asked how are you going to differentiate these three membranes? One is the PVD, second is the retinal detachment, third is the coral detachment. So this is a picture of a retinal detachment. You can see that uh, this is a somewhat wavy membrane here, and it is highly reflective. There is an optic nerve head attachment here. And uh, uh, see, you can see that this is how the corresponding A scan is going to help you. See, this is a membrane, and if you look at the A scan, you can see that the spike of the A scan is almost same as that of the height of the RCS complex, which means that this is a hundred percent spike. Percentage you generally compare with the spike of the RCS complex or the scleral complex, which is supposed to be hundred percent. So this is almost equal, and uh, also, you can see that it is almost uniformly uh, having this spike height. And again, you are having this optic nerve head attachment, so which definitely uh, shows that this is probably retinal attachment. But you will have to confirm this by assessing the motility of the membrane, which is important. So that is what you see here. So this is a video of the same uh, B scan. You can see that uh, when the eye moves, there is not much of after movements for the stick membrane. And also you can see that when the A scan is moving from along the line of this membrane, there is not much difference in the spike height, which means that it is, it is more or less uniform. So a uniformly reflect, highly reflective membrane, optic nerve head attachment, relatively uh, low movements, no after movements, then we can be pretty sure that this is a retinal attachment. Now compare this with this membrane. See, here also the eye is moving, but you can see that the movements of this particular membrane, it is showing that wavy undulating movements, which is referred to as the after movements, after movements. That is, the movements 
just persist even after the eye has stopped moving you just wait after the patient has moved the eyes then once the movement stops then you see what happens to them you can see this baby movement and that is a very important feature of a posterior pilot detachment or a pvd and another thing is that the uh, spike height see just compare this spike you can see that this spike height is about only 50 to 60 percent of the rcs complex and also if you move the a scan along this membrane then also you will find that it is not uniform as you saw in the retinal detachment so multiple areas you will be getting multiple spike heights so these are the features by which you differentiate a pvd from a retinal detachment now this is the third membrane so as you see it is much more thicker than retinal detachment it is dome shaped and you look at the corresponding a scan you can see a particular feature you can see a double spike here this is called an m spike so these are features of the coral detachment. The M spike is or two spikes are because you have got two things there. First spike is from the retina overlying the coroid and second is from the coroid. That is why you get the M spike. So the M spike or the M pattern will be get you will be getting only when the retina is also uh, I mean retina is in apposition with the coroid. So that is the M pattern. And uh, this space, you can see that there is not much of spikes here, which means that whatever is in here it is not hemorrhage, it is serous fluid. It is probably a coral detachment. Now, this is a scan. Uh, can you just comment about the optic nerve? I mean, that is one thing that you look for, you know, optic nerve attachment. That is important even in coral detachment because coral detachment never has got an optic nerve attachment. It stops at the equator doesn't extend posteriorly beyond the equator but this is a scan where you cannot assess that because this is a transfer scan it's a transfer scan so transfer scan of the upper part the optic nerve will not be there on the other hand this is an axial scan you can see that the optic nerve head is here so here you can see that coroidal the typical shape the dong shaped shape and uh, the coroidal detachment extending only up to the equator not going posteriorly beyond the equator and anteriorly it extends even beyond the aura serrata. The two coral detachments are approximate, I mean, approaching each other in the form of a kissing coroid. And the supracoroidal space is epolucent, telling you that this is again serous fluid. So, so probably this is a coroidal effusion and not hemorrhage. And there will be absolutely no movement here, no after movement. So this is how you differentiate a coral detachment from a retinal detachment. And here you can see that this is also coral detachment. You can see multiple uh, lobules here. And here you can see that in the supracoral space, there are a lot of high intensity point like echoes telling you that this is supra, uh, sub, I mean, supracoroidal uh, bleeding or something something like an expulsive hemorrhage, supracoroidal hemorrhage. So suppose you have a patient with an expulsive coral hemorrhage then it is very very important that you follow this patient with this scan you should also be looking at spaces echolucent spaces inside these cavities inside this high intensity spice which tells you that the clot has begun to lyse and probably will help you to time time your intervention with respect to a drainage of the supracoral blood because either you drain it immediately during expulsive of oral hemorrhage or you wait for the clot to lyse which these can can tell you by demonstrating these echolucent spaces inside this hemorrhage so that is how the b scan can help you in timing the surgery now the third important uh, b scan picture so now we have completed the point like echoes then the membranes we have covered then the third one is a mass like echo. So, the, I mean, these are the just three things that you will be uh, shown in the examination, nothing else. So, either it will be point, then membrane, or the mass like echo. The mass like echoes would be a little confusing for the PEs. So, you just um, uh, try to explain a few concepts here. Now, this is a homogeneous mass. Homogeneous mass means the internal structure is uniform. There are no interfaces here, it is composed of the same tissue. So, here what happens is that you can see the wave come here, strikes here, produces one reflection, so you get a high intensity spike here. Okay, so that is what is seen by the A scan. 
and after that the sound wave just goes inside then there is no reflection here because there are no interfaces no interfaces here okay this is the same uniform tissue so it just goes like that and correspondingly you will be seeing only very low reflections which is called low internal reflectivity this is the usual picture in a choroidal melanoma so when you have a homogeneous mass there will not be internal reflection so you get low internal reflectivity okay and then it again strike another interface which is the uh, rcs complex and you get one more spike and then it goes off usually so this sort of a picture is what you get in a choroidal melanoma see here this is a so first of all there is a typical shape here this is a mass like echo this collar button shape is so typical it doesn't generally appear in any other mass here it is having this particular shape because it shows that it is broken through the black membrane and that is why this sort of a shape is here and you can see the first high spike and then due to the homogeneity the spike decreases this is low internal reflectivity then you have got one high spike and it goes like that so see how well the corresponding x scan helps you to uh, demonstrate or know this internal reflectivity that is the importance of this uh, simultaneous x scan here now we will just uh, uh, consider a few more features of this choroidal melanoma few more ultrasound uh, features uh, here you can see two membranes like here see attached to the here there is no attachment but here you can see that this membrane like shadows here and fluid here so this is an associated x-rayed attachment which is generally seen in uh, choroidal melanoma but the tip generally you don't have a detachment the detachment is further away from the tumor generally okay so this is another feature and this is another thing so you can see that uh, this is also choroidal melanoma and uh, when the ultrasound goes you see a clear area here now this is called uh, acoustic shadowing this is because of because the homogeneity is always get absorbed and at the base of the lesion uh, there is a significant degree of sound attenuation and that is why this appearance of acoustic following is seen so this is also another typical feature of a choroidal melanoma acoustic following another interesting feature is what is referred to as choroidal excavation here what you see is that again due to the homogeneity the reflections the sound wave gets attenuated and you see a sort of a hypoechoic area here now look at the contrast between this hypoechoic area and the surrounding coral this area you have got a normal reflectivity because sound waves are uh, uh, incident here without any passing through the through the tumor and so here the surrounding coral will be normally reflective and this area will appear as if it is excavated so this is referred to as coral excavation so an appearance due to the contrast between the surrounding normal reflectivity and the internal low reflectivity due to this particular feature of this melanoma so some important features of a coral melanoma internal low internal reflectivity this uh, acoustic following coral excavation now this is a heterogeneous mass again just look at it striking at the surface it produces a high internal reflectivity and inside there are lot of blood vessels which results in multiple interfaces this is a typical feature that you generally get in tumors like choroidal hemangioma so because of the tightly packed blood vessels and blood there will be multiple interfaces here and so the sound waves doesn't go go unhindered like that each of these interfaces will be giving reflections back to the probe and so you will get high internal reflectivity so this is the difference between the low internal reflectivity of choroidal melanoma and the high internal reflectivity of a choroidal hemangioma okay so this is what explain so this is a choroidal hemangioma you can see that the corresponding s can the first spike and you can see the high reflectivity inside this this is referred to as the high internal reflectivity so this helps you to actually very clearly differentiate between a choroidal hemangioma and a choroidal melanoma in which ultrasound plays a major role okay so this is again very specific you can see that very there's a tumor here but there are 
very high reflectivity areas this sort of intense shadow this is a low uh, gain uh, low gain b scan and uh, even in this low gain b scan you can see these areas lighting up like this so this is calcium so a tumor with calcium like this definitely know that this is a retinoblastoma and generally you will be also given some history regarding this particular b scan like say this belongs to a two year old child with this particular picture and then so another clue is there so one clue is regarding the age and second clue is regarding uh, this thing and if you have a corresponding a scan also then that is another addition okay this is a melanocytoma here you can see that now so we have just covered uh, three uh, different tumors which have got specific reflectivity now the other tumors the internal reflectivity varies so it is not uh, low internal reflectivity like oral melanoma it is not high internal reflectivity like the hemangioma it would be somewhere via media so melanocytoma will be having relatively high internal echoes here and this is a metastatic depot from the carcinoma with about moderate internal reflectivity the other things are just like a mass like lesion okay and this you can see this is a plaque like lesion which is having a very high reflectivity this is also a low gain scan into the high internal reflectivity and you can see that the sound doesn't go beyond this this particular lesion doesn't allow the sound to actually go resulting in a shadowing in this area so this tells you that this is probably calcium or bone so this much area of something like this is generally bone so this is a choroidal osteoma okay and this is again a metastatic choroidal lesion from the breast you can see moderate internal uh, reflectivity here okay <clears throat> what about this again those picture if you don't know about it just start explaining just start so you can just um, uh, describe that you can see a lot of point like echoes in the cavity and this point like echoes is bound by a membrane here and this is probably either a pvd or a detachment but it looks like a pvd because the reflectivity is not very high so this is probably vitreous membrane with a membrane here and here there is a mass like shadow but look at the surface of this mass you can see that the surface is irregular it is lobulated like this lobulated and here you can see a very curious thing you can see that the this particular high intensity point like echoes is actually joining this lobule so this is actually a subretinal hemorrhage with breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage so sometimes subretinal hemorrhage alone also produce this sort of a mass lesion which might be a little confusing to differentiate that from oral tumor so some of the features which helps you to actually differentiate a subretinal hemorrhage is this which is a bumpy lobulated surface internal reflectivity is typically variable because it depends upon the age of the hemorrhage the hemorrhage initially may be uh, you know just point that goes then it can produce membrane then it can get absorbed producing uh echo echo lucent areas then a secondary retinal detachment over the lesion may be noted now when you see something like this this is definitely point where it is a major breakthrough which is a major now if you are still in doubt you can just follow up this scan and you can just see what happens to this lesion because if it is vitreous hemorrhage something definitely is going to happen to vitreous hemorrhage as you can see here so this was the initial picture of a subretinal hemorrhage so and this is the picture 6 weeks later you can see that the intensity is much less there are occlusion spaces here because it has drained into the vitreous it has broken into the vitreous so the amount of capacity inside here has markedly decreased so such a change tells you that this is vitreous hemorrhage i mean not vitreous hemorrhage subretinal it was a subretinal hemorrhage and uh, another important uh, b scan which is often shown in which is invariably given to you in the examination is an intraocular foreign body which is actually very easy to uh, diagnose because you know intraocular foreign body typically shows this very high intensity spike even more than 100% and uh, so you can see that this is a spike and this is an impacted intraocular foreign body and just because the metallic foreign bodies reflects the sound completely it doesn't allow much of the sound to 
pass after it. So there will be some amount of shadowing here. You can see this shadowing here. That is a orbital shadowing behind the intraocular foreign body. Then it is specific metallic and stone mold foreign bodies are the ones which gives you very high spikes. On the other hand, wood and vegetable material will give you only intermediate echoes. And uh, this is what I just told you about the shadowing because there will be a rapid drop in the intensity of the sound waves because the sound is not allowed to pass across the foreign body. Now, there are certain interesting artifacts also which is produced by the foreign body, which is a little difficult to actually uh, understand. But you know, just uh, talk of the stems uh, just without understanding that. So, just imagine a foreign body, you know. Uh, 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 let us say an iron piece, something like that, which has got two surfaces, two parallel surfaces. So when you have got two parallel surfaces like this, what happens is that the sound strikes one surface, gets re reflected, received by the transducer, it produces one shadow, one bright shadow. But this goes and hits the second surface and is reflected back. And so it arrives at the transducer at a much later uh, time and so you get a much less Indian shadow which is much deeper than the original shadow and because this reflection goes to and fro like that multiple such shadows will be formed so this is referred to as reverberations so whenever you have got you know parallel surface for example you just see this foreign body this is a very anterior foreign body which has got parallel surface metal and see there is one high intensity shadow here and there's multiple shadows produced deeper to the foreign body here. So this is what is referred as reverberation, again typical foreign body. Intraocular lens also can produce this sort of foreign body because of the, I mean, this sort of reverberation because of the parallel surfaces, I mean intraocular lens. And this is another typical uh, reverberation. So this type of strong reverberation, see, look at the foreign body here and look at the reverberation, just going on like this. So this sort of reverberation occurs when you have got very close parallel spaces as in a spherical foreign body when you have got something like a air gun air uh, bullet or something like that that is when you get this sort of reverberations and this sclera uh, is important because sclera uh, this can generally helps you to uh, diagnose scleral thickening and the presence of fluid in the tenant space which you see in posterior scleritis. You can see this fluid here in the tenant fluid. So you get an equolucent area here which is merging with the optic nerve and this is your characteristic T sign which is seen in posterior scleritis. You can also see that there is a large thickening of the coroid here. So inflammation of the sclera, I mean especially posterior scleritis diagnosis, this can play a very very important role. And this is a picture of a posterior staphyloma. You can see that uh, there is smooth uh, X-shaped uh, outpouching of the posterior scleral wall like this, the bulging backwards. Now, sometimes if it's a coloboma, it will be much more sharper margins, not uniform margins, like it will be much more sharper, punched out margins. And as far as the optic nerve is concerned, you know, cupping maybe you can, but nobody will be using these can find out an optic disc cupping. Yeah, you can see the cupping, but not a very good tool to assess optic nerve cupping. But optic disc drusen, these can play a very important role. For example, suppose you have an optic disc edema, I mean optic disc swelling. You, I mean you may doubt that this is due to a buried optic disc drusen, it's a pseudo disc edema. Then the B scan will help you. For example, you can see this high India reflectivity spike, which is uh, given by the optic disc drusen. Yeah, this is papillima, the typical crescent sh shape sign. It's called the crescent sign. This is due to the fluid which is accumulating in the optic nerve sheath, uh, which sometimes you get in florid papillima. Okay. Yes, uh, PGs, uh, all those who have listening, I um, uh, it was a wonderful talk. Talk, in hand, uh, uh, we have learned that a dynamic B scan cannot be replaced. Um, and it is very important to comment on the topography, reflectivity, and mobility for coming to a diagnosis. So I would like to ask doubts, your doubts, in examination of uh, 
a patient with the b scan or in as well as in interpretation of a picture or a report sir uh, uh, like yeah. in how do you do b scan over the cornea or the lid over the cornea or the lid well i mean ideally it should be done with an uh, open eye because that will actually help you to increase the quality of your b scans so but practically uh, generally most of us generally do it over the lid because it, uh, you know many practical issues are there for example it could be a trauma it could be they are not very uh, sure about the sterility of this can but uh, ideally if possible it should be done on an open eye i mean uh, not okay. over the lid but on the on the cornea but uh, having said that practically we also most often do it over the lid so how do you sterilize the tip tip how do you sterilize yeah, the tip, the tip especially because for the this can yes. yeah, you can just use isopropyl alcohol the same thing that you use in your for your explanation uh, geometry or all those things so you can just have got an isopropyl alcohol wipe okay uh, um jr please uh, type your uh, question in the chat box or if you would like to um uh, talk um you can just put a uh, message in the chat box so that i can know okay then uh, like same another question is whether which is better uh, to do b scan in sitting position or lying down position again um, you know lying down position is better but uh, that also i mean practically i mean personally i i mean do generally in sitting position only because it is practically much more convenient for the patient and every time you may not be able to get a bed however you want to make the patient lying down but characteristically it is described that it would better done in a sitting position But generally, you okay. know, it doesn't uh, so, make a difference. Yeah. Okay. Ha ha ha. Okay. Now, uh, like, uh, when you select the A vector, uh, have you should you select it before we start the B scan, or uh, can we uh, drag the A vector onto the B scan once you get the B scan picture? Yeah, you can drag. It depends upon your machine. If the machine has got your back capable, generally it will be recorded as a video, so it gives you the facility to actually. drag the uh, vector at any time so that is enough after okay. doing a b scan so that, also that just... be... okay. yes so pre or to the post graduates you can either you choose the a vector at the start of your uh, b scan or suppose somebody has done it and you want to go and see that again you can ask uh, uh, select the a vector and scroll it over the um, existing picture Basically, you basically take the printout. Yeah, basically yes. you should enable your, I mean, a scan vector also. The menu of this um, scan, which is not enabled by default, so you have to enable your a scan vector so that the machine will be doing that a scan vector along with your video of the B scan. So if that is done at any point, you okay. can go back and drag your error. Okay. So that is a very important point. Uh, does the amount of gel affect the quality of the scan? Yeah, it should not be too much, but uh, the gel should be there because uh, you know, I mean, uh, these uh, uh, the scans have what is known as a you know, sort of a dead space. Uh, so I mean, if you look at the scan, it just suppresses the uh, reflectivity. Immediately anterior to the probe, like you don't get much of a reflective difference okay. in the lid or the cornea. So for this okay. to happen, a sufficient amount of gel has to be there. Yes, so that and that is another important point which you should take into consideration. Suppose there is a penetrating injury or a glob rupture is suspected, or this open injury is suspected. What well, how we should go ahead, sir? well that is um, i mean something which we uh, am a little uh, hesitant to uh, uh, give some guidelines to post graduate because ideally it is said that you can do a general b scan but generally i mean after you are initial primary repair you can do a general b scan even suppose you are suspecting an obvious penetrating injury nobody will be doing a b scan or an open go so the question is when you have suspecting yes. something like an Sure. So that time we can do a what is known as a general B scan, or 
other cases, penetrating injury, you suture the penetrating injury, you do the primary repair, and then the following day or the day after, uh, I mean, two days later, again, you can do a B scan, but uh, you need to be a little gentle here. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are incidents where, you know, the occult ruptures has been converted into a real rupture by these B scans. Yes, we should be very gentle. Now we have a question yeah. from the audience. Is there any particular probe setting for orbital lesions? Orbital lesions, well, there is something like an orbital mode, uh, which uh, actually I think uh, decreases the frequency a little so that the penetration is a little more. So that orbital mode will be there in most of the B scans. But having said that, I don't think even the orbital surgeons would be relying too much on a B scan for actually giving them a proper diagnosis of the orbital lesions. Orbital lesions, I think anybody will be doing a CT scan or MRI. Yes. But if somebody so, is so particular uh, about this thing, maybe sir, parasites. Mode. Sir, if parasites are suspected, like parasitic granuloma or orbital, like that, uh, maybe the kinetic, yeah. the mobility. B scan may be helpful. What do no, you think? I mean, you are not going to get that much of a mobility for an orbital lesion. If it is inside, if it is an intraarterial okay. cyst, then okay. that is okay. But orbital parasites and all again, I don't think the uh, B scan is a very good. Dirofilaria. Again, I mean, if, if it is a cyst, again, one thing is that anything which is less than one millimeter will not be picked up by B scan. Okay, it has to be above more than okay, one sir. millimeter. It needs to have interfaces. It doesn't depend upon the lesion. It needs to have interfaces. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that point is clear, very clear. Now another question: Is it possible to have attachment to optic nerve in case of PVD? Like, or is it like that there will never be an attachment? Audience is asked. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can um, uh, think of situation. Now, what happens in a usual patient, for example, a, an age-related PVD or a usual PVD. Now, the detachment starts initially from the optic disc. Okay, so you get the TV's ring and then it comes anteriorly like that. And finally, the aura cellata get detached. So most of this time, unless you have got an anomalous PVD, uh, you generally won't get a optic neural attachment in a usual PVD. But having said that, just imagine a case like, for example, a young patient he is having a vitritis or a vitreous hemorrhage. So it can have, have a localized PVD, for example, a toxoplasma. You can have a localized PVD where the uh, choroiditis is, is. Or suppose you have got a diabetic patient. A diabetic patient again can have a PVD where the uh, Hyroid is attached to the optic nerve head, but the, in the periphery there is a space because the new cells are growing there and there is some amount of exudation. So there are situations where you can have this PVD with attachment to the optic nerve head, but generally in a usual PVD, that is an PVD or one or which, which is associated with an RRD, in such situation you don't have an optic nerve head attachment, but other situations, anomalous PVD you can have. And again, when you have a PVD uh, with multiple attachments, sometimes you can have a PVD where the posterior hyoid, you can see the attached to multiple places, the optic nerve head, multiple areas on the retina. Now, this is a typical feature that you get in sometimes uh, in uh, uh, PDR, polyphenol diabetic retinopathy, when you have got these fibers, multiple fibers attachments. So that can happen in traditional. So that is a uh, sort of feature of a TRD in diabetic uh, retinal detachment or diabetic uh, in PDR. So there are situations where you can have this. But generally speaking, uh, this is the usual scenario. Okay. So can we differentiate uh, tractional detachment like tabletop RDs from thick posterior hyaloid? Like in the diabetic retinopathy, you get both. So seeing the B scan, is it possible to differentiate? Yeah, from the B scan alone, it might not be that easy. I mean, you'll be seeing multiple membranes. For example, especially that is one important feature of a diabetic TRD. You know, you might have multiple membranes mm -hmm. there, and all these membranes would be thick also. 
and uh, it will not be the usual type of a thin membrane low reflectivity that you will be getting because there will be a lot of hemorrhage the, the positive hyaluronic will be layered by the hemorrhage there will be multiple membranes so all you can see will be the multiple membrane so when you have this multiple membrane it will be a little difficult on the other hand if you have one membrane which is far into the vitreous and another uh, detachment which is which is very uh, sort of a uh, concave sort of a detachment then uh, maybe you can say that uh, there is a trd underlying the pvd okay thank you sir so uh, one more uh, question uh, if a audience have any question please uh, put it in the chat box so what is time varied gain tvg time varied gain yeah gain i am I, I just i'm not very well versed with the time varied gain i can say, i mean generally gain generally gain what it means that you know it's something like a uh you know the volume volume control of your uh, stereo suppose you are listening to music and all it's not very loud mean that you just increase the volume so you can all even pick up the low notes and uh, suppose okay. it is very, very audible the sounds are all uh, so audible and you want to pick up something from that differentiate you just turn down the volume so that is varying the gain for example let us see if you have a case where you got a vitreous hemorrhage and an intraocular foreign body okay so when you scan at high uh, gain you see a lot of point like echoes along with the high reflectivity from the foreign body so you may be a little confused so here if you just turn down the gain then you will be seeing you will be suppressing all those echoes from the vitreous hemorrhage and only the echoes from the foreign body will be remaining so that is the gain control Uh, what the gain control can uh, help help you with okay so gain is basically to uh, differentiate the quality of the um, shadows okay now uh, many yeah. often uh, the students will place the probe with pointer in one particular position but they fail to enter the position of the pointer in the machine uh, so when we yeah. see a print out it is very difficult to comment what type of scan has been taken so what what would you suggest how 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 they should go ahead um in uh, uh, like you have said the five important uh, scans like t60 t3 so uh, where they sh should they enter the pointer position change the pointer position in each scan Uh, yeah ideally, ideally it should be like that because that is something which is uh, never done in our situation that is something which we all I mean, always try to stress it but uh, nobody really does that systematically it should be the way so you should have a sort of a protocol so if you just go about in one protocol say first you start with a t12 then it is t6 then t3 t9 so after finishing this four scan you can just uh, consecutively enter the names like that and uh, there are facilities where you can enter it in the uh, machine itself and uh, some of these machines allow you to take uh, representative photographs where you can enter it so ideally it should be entered after each position in the in the scan itself if you want it along with the printout but uh, again we all try, I mean, try to save time and it is a little time consuming so at least if you do like that at least be aware of the sequence in which you are doing this scanning and when you get the print out at least manually write it down. okay so ideally it should be marked like what scan that is t12 t6 t3 t9 ax 12 ax3 like that in the b scan itself but if that is you, you are just, just sort of cutting corners now at least in your print out you manually mark it or there are uh, I mean, situations where some I mean, some of our pages just take photographs also photographs in their mobiles uh, camera i mean mobile cameras so immediately after that that is something we sometimes follow immediately after you clicking the photograph then you can just edit it in your mobile phone just add uh, that particular label that will also help you to actually uh, retrieve what type of scan which you have taken at a later time 
Yes, sir. So that is a point well taken. Uh, even even when you draw a diagrammatic representation of the picture, uh, ensure that uh, you uh, tell uh, or clearly mark what type of scan you have taken and where is the pointer. One more question from the audience, sir. Is there any cutoff for grading A scan spikes into low, moderate, and high intensity? No, there is no definite cutoffs like that. You can just compare with the RCS complex and uh, the, I mean, and uh, just label it as a percentage of the RCS complex. That's all. Okay. So, uh, should we move the probe to the fornix, sir, or is it enough that you keep it at one point? Yeah, I just left out uh, that part uh, actually because there is a lot of uh, uh, things which have been left out here because that cannot be covered in detail here. Yes, sir. So I ideally, understand. yes, sir. You know that it is not the four transverse position. There are also oblique transverse position, and each transverse position you will have to pivot the probe from the limbus to the fornix so that you are moving from posterior to the anterior. For example, if you are just keeping it at the limbus, you will be probably getting the posterior ball. And then if you move it towards the equator of the uh, globe, that is a little more towards the phonic, then you will be getting a little more of the equatorial region of the uh, particular area which you are scanning. For example, in the upper limbus position, if you are moving it to equator, the lower inferior half equator you will be getting so likewise you will be i mean uh, even labeling it as posterior then posterior equatorial then equatorial posterior then uh, aura serrata severe body like that so that is a, uh, a little too deep into the b scan that is something which uh, generally i don't think uh, yes. the postgraduate will be doing Yes, sir. I understand. The point is uh, you have to move the probe depending upon where is the lesion and try to find out the anteroposterior extent, the transverse extent, the quality of echoes within whether it is mobile or not, as well as the reflectivity. So uh, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Can we go ahead with your next talk, sir? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you see the retinal uh, lasers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can see. Yes, so, this is just a very brief account. I'm not going into details here. Uh, we'll be just giving you an overview of the retinal lasers where it is used without going into details. So, generally, you know that the mechanism of action of a retinal laser is that you know, the light energy is converted to heat at the level of the retina, resulting in denaturation of the protein. And that is what we refer to as photocoagulations. There are several mechanisms and theories about how it actually produces a retinal injury and all those things. So those things I think you can just read up. And the, regarding the wavelength, the most popular wavelength that we use is the 532 nanometer, uh, which is the green wavelength. And uh, the one laser which we are using is the double frequency arc. Previously it was argon, now it is the double frequency arc. And the other wavelength is the 810 nanometer diode laser. These are the two main wavelengths, but that is being still being used. And uh, and uh, uh, these are the main techniques regarding the conventional laser photographic method. The first is a pan retinal photocoagulation or PRP. Uh, this is a picture of a PRP where you are use the lasers to actually destroy large pitiful areas of the retina. Uh, you can see here, you just pair the posterior pole, whatever is between inside the arcade or the macula is paired, and the rest of the area of the retina is covered with this laser burn, which is spaced one to two burn widths apart. And so, this much area of the retina is ablated, and this is generally done. I think most of you know, uh, I'm not going into detail, but you know that it is done in cases of uh, where there is large amount of retinal ischemia resulting in neovascularization as happens in proliferated IV retinopathy, then retinal vein occlusions, heart disease, uh, etc. So that is pan retinal photocoagulation. The second uh, one where again this photocoagulation is used in this intensity is to a barrage laser. That is when you have a break like this, you use the laser to produce 
chororetinal adhesions around these breaks so that this is sealed and there is no fluid getting into it and it doesn't go on to produce a retinal detachment. So this is used in retinal breaks and during vitrectomy for retinal detachment we sometimes use it to actually uh, do even a 360 degree barrage. When you do a retinectomy or retinotomy we uh, do this barrage. So whenever you want to uh, produce this chororetinal adhesions in order to prevent uh, detachment of the retina or prevent fluid from entering a break, we call it a barrage laser. So that is the second situation where you do a photocoagulation. And the third situation is doing focal laser burn. This is you are doing very precise burns in the macular area or focal area uh, to close all the microaneurysms as in the case of a focal non center involving diabetic macular edema. Probably this is the only type of diabetic macular edema where you are still using the laser, that is the focal non center involving diabetic macular edema, where you specifically close all the microaneurysm. Then confluent focal laser burns are given to close off vascular malformations and new vessels when these are outside the foveal vascular zone as in of an extra foveal CNVM, then polyp sometimes, then uh, RAMs or retinal artery macroaneurysms, then vasoproliferative tumors, angiomas, etc. And sometimes when you have a uh, CSCR, central serous chorioretinopathy with a leak which is well outside the foveal vascular zone. Again, you use gentle focal burns to close off the leaking spots. And laser parameter generally is that you use a spot size of 50 to 100 microns for the focal macular laser. That is, it is 50 to 100 microns. For the PRB, you use larger burn which is 200 to 500 microns. And again, for the extra macular focal also, you use a slightly larger band, for example, 200 microns. Power generally use this less when you come to the focal macular laser, which comes, which, which can range from 80 millivolts to 200 millivolts. And as far as the PRP is concerned, 100 to 700 millivolts. In barrage also 100 to 700 millivolts. You generally titrate this burn depending upon the burn that you are getting. For the macular laser, you need a gentle white burn. The other one, you'll get a little more a moderate white burn. The duration is generally set as 100 to 200 milliseconds. So I just uh, sort of compiled everything together here. Then the laser delivery, that also I think, you know, the most common, the most preferred, the most popular one is sit lamp with the help of these indirect contact lenses. Generally, the mainster standard lens, the area centralis, these are the lenses for the uh, macular lasers. Then you have got also the mainster BRP lens and uh, the kind fundoscopic lens, etc. for the peripheral laser. Then you have got the direct lens, which is the Goldman three mirror central lens. And uh, many of us actually prefer the delivery through the laser uh, indirect ophthalmoscope, LIO, or you just need a 10 dd lens and uh, laser is delivered via the indirect ophthalmoscope. So these are the two methods of delivery in a conventional laser. Now, we have got newer treatment patterns now because now, I mean, most of our uh, the CITLAM lasers, we are shifted because we also now have what is known as a patent scan laser or a multi spot laser or PRP. So, here a single foot pedal depression results in a simultaneous multiple uniform laser burned by a variety of patterns. So there are multiple patterns you can have anywhere from uh, you know uh, two, two to three burns to almost. Uh, 12 to 15 burns in a single go and this can be in different patterns also like a line pattern, circle pattern. So uh, what happens is that the whole thing is actually you can do it in a much lesser time so this re results in more patient comfort also. And uh, again uh, it also there are some parameters which actually help to decrease the duration of the laser and the total energy delivered also and so this helps to actually decrease the laser scars also so that way also it is much more safer. Then another newer concept is a subthreshold micropulse laser where the laser energy is delivered in ultra short or microsecond pulses with adjustable on and off times. So this has been found to be useful in diabetic macroedema and CSCR. Now the 
uh, what we are aiming at is that the previous MACLA lasers, I mean, if you, the new PGs will not be aware of this thing, but uh, if, uh, the, the, even the younger staff will be knowing that when you, when you are used to do grit laser and all those things, there are a lot of patients who comes back with the extension of the laser scars in the fovea. And those things we don't see nowadays because we have practically given up grit laser. And even the focal lasers, we are trying to actually reduce the energy by resorting to what is known as subthreshold micropulse laser. And the other one is a targeted retinal photocalculation, TRP, where we do this wide field angiography and uh, selectively uh, laser the areas of non perfusion, then sometimes feeder vessels in uh, CNVM, etc. Now, another type of uh, laser that we use in post segment is a photo disruption. When you have a something like a fresh subhyloid hemorrhage like this, you use a hyloid order. Of it. That is, you do, and the laser that you use for this is a NDAG laser, and you, which, which is the photo disruptive laser. The other laser which I have been talking till now was the laser which produces photocoagulation. This is photo disruption, that is tissue disruption. So you disrupt the hyloid here. So you just select an area where there is sufficient uh, space between the surface of the blood and the retina towards the lower part of the hemorrhage and make a small area of photo disruption allowing the fresh blood to drain. So that is the principle of photo disruption or hyloidotomy. And the, the last one probably is the PDT uh, where we otherwise call the type of in photodynamic therapy. So it is a stepwise procedure. The first step we inject this uh, vertipofin dye, as you can see, it is an IV administration along the pivotal vein. And uh, this vertipofin, once it comes to the uh, retina, it gets concentrated in this blood vessels of the corroded neosma membrane. So this is the area where which we are going to target. And once this dye is there, then you use this uh, laser in order to actually specifically activate this dye by using a specific wavelength of light using a non-thermal diode laser and uh, this will result in activation of the dye and destruction of these vessels selectively so that is the principle of photodynamic therapy so this was originally developed to treat cnvm in new astral age related macular degeneration and now the since the arrival of this anti vegf the use in CNVM is mostly limited to refractory CNVM, which is not fully responding to the anti vegf and sometimes also in a combination therapy that is along with the anti vegf And uh, another, uh, and uh, the primary indication of the PDT has now changed to polypodal coronal vasculopathy PCV and in central serous polyuretinopathy where you actually decreases the fluence and do a low fluence therapy. And even the PCV also, now there's a shift because ever since the FLIPS versus has come in, then also now the primary uh, modality sometimes has been shifted to FLIPS from uh, PDT. Okay, so that is about a brief overview of the laser. I just, yeah, I just sort of um, uh, mentioned the laser. So, I just targeted it as sort of a short note for the postgraduate. Suppose you need to write a short note about the lasers, the different lasers which are used in post segment, then you can uh, write based upon these things. So further, this is not a complete presentation. I think you'll have to go and read a little more into that. So when you're combining these two presentations, I thought it would be a, a, I just made it a little brief. Thank you, sir. Okay, it was a you. precise and crisp presentation. A uh, few questions, uh, like uh, change in the lens, does it affect the spot size of the uh, retinal burns? Yeah, so each lens, I think if you can just go, uh, there will be a sort of a chart available actually. So the magnification that is provided by each lens is different. So there will be a change, not a major change but uh, there will be change. So you will have to know the magnification of the lens that you are using when you do the lasers. 
Yes, that is especially when you try to laser the macula, uh, the uh, size of the spot should be uh, correct. Now, how many burns can we give at a single setting? I think you are referring to the uh, PRP. PRP, sir. Yes, PRP. Yeah, yeah. I mean, classically, what is described in textbook is that you generally limit it to 1,500 to 2,000 burns in uh, one city. You know, you just go about in a quadrant manner. Uh, that is in order to prevent accumulation of fluid, macular edema, things like that. But practically, what we have seen is that you know uh, those obligations are not as much as what is described and. Uh, uh, I mean, personally, I don't strictly limit myself to that limit. I generally complete it in two sittings and some of them in even one sitting also. Okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, like when we plan uh, fill in PRPs or add PRPs, uh, is there any uh, protocol like you should give you go first up to the aura serrata and then to the posterior pole like that no, there's nothing like that i think that is depending upon your convenience in fill in prp uh, you know that uh, uh, for example in your initial prp you would be leaving a space of about uh, you know, half dd to one dd from the rp so those space i think you would be generally filling as a last resort and uh, okay, sir. Uh, you can even come one uh, even inside the arcade also to one row if things are not getting controlled but that is only as okay, a last how, resort okay how close to the disc we can go again uh, uh, you need to uh, leave us uh, a safe area of half this diameter to one this diameter around the disc yes so especially those who have uh, completed their um, jr ship and are going for sr ship when you get a hands-on uh, always try to limit yourself to within half to one disc diameter from the disc and at, uh, that from the arcade also uh yeah, only about the nasal aspect. You know, that is where you uh, want to come close to this kind of the temple aspect. Anyway, you are not coming anywhere close to this because that area you are not going to laser. So the superior part, inferior yes. part, the nasal part. So nasal part, the okay. initial settings you just go one dd. Then if you want for the fill in PRP, you can come a little more. Okay, sir. Is there any role for diode laser? Yeah, diode laser, I think it is still being done. You know, we are still having a diode laser in our uh, hospital. So I don't think uh, the other one is actually much more comfortable for the patient. Being laser. The diode laser generally, it is an RP centric. It produces deeper burns. It produces more pain. So it is not very comfortable for the patient. Uh, but otherwise, as far as the effects are concerned, uh, it produces the same effect. Okay, sir. So transconjunctival uh, anterior retinal photocoagulation. Um, is there any uh, like role? Yeah, if you have the problem, you can definitely uh, do that. You know, it is much more uh, easier and uh, much, much. I mean, uh, much more easier and less cumbersome than taking the patient and uh, doing a cyclopray. So, if you have got the probe, you can definitely do that. Okay. So, uh, my audience, would you like to ask any question? So, what will happen if PRP is done in single setting? Why do you split PRP into multiple settings? Yeah, because uh, I mean, you know, the one of the complications that they have that has been mentioned is the presence of a uh, accumulation of fluid so because of the inflammation, so increased inflammation of the uh, retina which is induced by the laser burns can sometimes lead on to accumulate the fluid in the macula as well as sometimes in the peripheral retina and even in the choroid sometimes even resulting in choroid effusion so there have been some cases that very few very rarely we have encountered situations where patients has come back with 
uh, oral effusion also. I mean, hardly I think in all these years I have seen just two cases like that. Macular edema is a much okay, more uh, complication, but uh, having said that, in our sort of patient, many of these patients come very late. You know, one eye having vitreous hemorrhage, yeah. another eye having a high risk period, about to bleed. And in such mm -hmm. situation, we generally forget about this thing, and uh, many of these cases we give it in one sitting also, explaining the patient about okay. the uh, all this risk. Okay, sir. Uh -huh. How do we go about when there is an element of tractional? Detachment or there is a fibrous fibrovascular proliferation. Yeah, fibrovascular proliferation, I think you need to be uh, really very careful because uh, uh, fibrovascular proliferation, the laser uh, is not a very laser friendly thing because the laser burn can actually increase the fibros and can result in increased traction and sometimes increase in the traction detachment. Some, some of the cases you can even convert the TREs into a combined RD also. So you need to keep well away from the fibrovascular tissue when you are doing a uh, laser. So that is why when there is extensive fibrovascular proliferation in the posterior pole, I mean, there is not much space for you to laser and in such cases, probably the patient would be well off with the vitrectum. Okay. So uh, the point is very well taken. Uh, for the junior residents, it is very, very essential that we pick up the patient in the early PDR stage or in the very severe NPDR stage so that we give laser before uh, the complications of PDR like a vitreous hemorrhage or tractional detachment comes and uh, judiciously use laser, reduce, uh, use the uh, tailor made the uh, treatment and uh, wisely uh, follow up the patient so thank you very much sir for the exhaustive and lucid presentation hope uh, the jr uh, exam going as well as the practitioners who are attending have found this section very informative and uh, uh, useful um, it was an interactive session if anybody would like to uh, comment on the session or would like to put their input uh, you are welcome Viji, madam Viji, it was a wonderful talk both retinal lasers as yeah, well as the you, scan, B scan, I enjoyed really well. When I was having the doubt of diarophilia, yeah. because we see lots of um, diarophilia areas in our area also. So, yeah, I think I uh, really uh, need to thank uh, Dr. Patma also because I think uh, the most of the interaction is thanks to her only. You know? I think she has come prepared with a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Biju. Uh, it was a wonderful. Uh, uh, you know, elaborate uh, discussion on how to do a B scan. And uh, Dr. Padma has even highlighted even the smaller points. Uh, so it was very useful to the PGs. Uh, and uh, we'll definitely have the recorded version of this uh, session uh, on YouTube. So, you know, anybody can uh, revisit the whole uh, program. So thank you, Dr. Biju. It was uh, very nice. And you have taken a lot of efforts to make the slides and everything. So it was wonderful. Now I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Nirupama to give the vote of thanks. On behalf of Kodikod Ophthalmic Society, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Biju John for giving an excellent coverage of the topic. Thank you, postgraduates and other participants for attending. A word of appreciation and thanks to Dr. Meher and Dr. Padma for the smooth moderation of the session. And last but not the least, I must mention my deepest sense of appreciation to Mr. Sarjan, Milmet Division of Sun Pharma for the platform support rendered. Thank you all once again and good night. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Padma. Special thank you, Padma, as video mentioned. <laughs> thank you, madam. Good night. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir.